Right, so our last couple topics here, as far as solubility and KSP stuff, but it's just a little um, qualitative and hopefully explain some of the things that we've seen already this year. But the first part is uh, looking at the effect of pH on solubility. We know that some of our ionic compounds, some of our salts, create acidic and basic solutions, depending on what type of ions they're made of. But we can see here that sometimes our dissolved ions can undergo further reactions, like with water that we saw, the hydrolysis reactions, or with hydronium for acids. So if the anion that we create is the conjugate base of a weak acid, it will react with hydronium and ultimately affect the solubility. So here we see silver cyanide. Silver cyanide dissolves into the silver ion and the cyanide ion, and hopefully you recognize that the cyanide ion is the conjugate base of our weak acid HCN. And so that cyanide ion can react with hydronium. And here's a little typo, I think, on your notes packet. I have hydroxide there, but it should be water. But the cyanide ion reacts with hydronium, creating our weak acid HCN and water. And so as far as solubility is concerned, what that means to us, silver cyanide is more soluble in acidic solutions. Why? Le Chatelier. The cyanide is removed, so we would have this cyanide being taken out of the reaction. And when that happens, more silver cyanide is going to dissolve to replace it. So the solubility is increased in an acidic situation, unlike silver chloride. Silver chloride dissolves into the silver ion and the chloride ion that you recognize as the conjugate base of HCl, our strong acid. So chloride will not react with any additional hydronium ions present. Okay, hydrochloric acid, strong ion, always stays 100% dissociated. So that chloride ion will not have any significant reaction with hydronium. So the solubility of silver chloride is not affected by the pH of the solution. So the type of question I'm looking for us to be able to answer, and perhaps even the AP could ask you a question like this. Which of these salts would you expect to dissolve more readily in an acidic solution? Barium sulfate or barium fluoride? So when you see a question like that, you should envision in your head how those two salts are going to dissolve, dissociate. And so I have the two equations there for you. And hopefully you recognize that fluoride, that is our conjugate base of hydrofluoric acid, a weak acid. Sulfate comes from sulfuric acid. So we're going to expect barium fluoride to dissolve better in acidic solutions because we would see that that fluoride ion would react with hydronium to create the hydrofluoric acid. And so our equilibrium would be shifted to the right. Now it can get more detailed with this. You could say, well, wouldn't sulfate react with hydronium to make hydrogen sulfate first? And there are some calculations that can go along with this where you're actually looking at the Ka values and stuff, but that's beyond the scope of the course. We just want to be able to qualitatively answer a question about which salt would expect to dissolve more in acidic solutions. So you will see a question like that on your quick check and potentially on the AP exam. So our last topic here are complex ions. Ions form from a metal cation with a Lewis base attached by a coordinate covalent covalent bond. Now remember we don't really have to know about Lewis acids and bases but they're important to talk about sometimes especially like here. All the Lewis base is doing is donating two electrons, donating electrons. And that's what a coordinate covalent bond is. So with the coordinate co covalent bond meaning that both electrons in a bond coming from one species. So these metal cations, small little metal cations, like our transition metals as and aluminum, attach to molecules or ions having lone pairs. Water, extremely common. 
nitrogen compounds, extremely common, like ammonia, because both of the electrons can come from the lone pair and attach to those positive metal ions. Just as a little terminology, just in case, I know some of you are moving on in this world of chemistry. So the ligand, that's the Lewis base that bonds to the metal cation. So here we see the copper ammonia complex ion. All right, the ligand is the ammonia molecule, NH3. That's the Lewis base bonded to the metal cation. So here we see the formation of this copper ammonia ion, complex ion. And yes, there's an equilibrium constant, Kf, our formation or stability constant. And you can see it's written like any of our other equilibrium expressions. And here's its value. And hopefully you recognize this is a very stable ion. 4.8 times 10 to the 12th, that's a big number. And you can look at it the other way. Uh, the reciprocal is called the dissociation constant. And you can see the reciprocal for this complex ion, 2.1 times 10 to the negative 13th. It barely dissociates. And so again, these complex ions can be very, very stable. And so a couple of times this year, we did create that copper ammonia ion in lab. This is when we were adding concentrated ammonium hydroxide to copper 2 sulfate. And when that started happening, we first created the precipitate of copper 2 hydroxide. When we kept adding more base, all of a sudden the precipitate disappeared and we had that beautiful dark blue indigo complex ion color that was created. And that's kind of the stripped down version, but more technically, this is what's going on. Again, this is nothing I'm testing you on, just to hopefully explain some things to you and for those of you that are interested a little more in depth. Anytime we see that blue color of a copper solution, it's because the copper ion is surrounded by six water ions. hexa copper 2 ion. Yeah. So when four ammonias come in, it takes the place of four of those waters. There's still actually two waters attached. But here you see the more complex version of that reaction. And again, for those of you that are interested, that's why I've included this. So ultimately though, what we should know is that a precipitate, a precipitate that would normally form may not do so in a solution where a complex ion could form. And here's another little typo. I think you had NaCl there. But if we add sodium hydroxide to copper 2 chloride solution, we would expect a copper hydroxide precipitate to form under specific solution conditions, appropriate ones. And that's what we would see. However, if we added ammonia to this mixture, the formation of the complex ion would be much more favored over the precipitate formation. And that's what we saw in lab. Once there was enough ammonia, that precipitate went away. You can look at it through the eyes of the K values because we know that the formation of the complex ion is a much higher K value than our KSP for copper 2 hydroxide, a very slightly soluble salt. Last thing, complex ions also help explain why our salts that are made from metal ions form from weak bases aluminum hydroxide, iron 3 hydroxide, zinc hydroxide, nickel hydroxide. Why are these creating acidic solutions? Okay, so the, I believe on your last test I had like zinc nitrate. Why is that an acidic salt? Okay, aluminum nitrate. Why is aluminum nitrate an acidic salt? Well, nitrate, that comes from our strong family, so that's not there. So we have a weak, strong situation which is why we predicted an acidic salt. But why? Because we're actually creating a complex ion. So that aluminum ion creates a complex ion with water. Specifically, it gets surrounded by six water molecules. And then in turn, that complex ion reacts with water and creates hydronium. So again, it's just another little layer of explanation as besides just looking at a salt and saying strong, weak, acidic, explaining a little bit what's going on. 
All right, and that wraps up this unit. We will have the lab and a quick check and hope to see you soon.